party to select their next flag bearer in good time, since this would be a new flag bearer. And I pointed out to them why I would not be available for selection as a candidate in that election. So that was one of the points I communicated to the National Council. My absence as a candidate. The second point was my absence as a campaigner and I pointed out to them that um, there were two main reasons why I would, did not become a campaigner. The first one which concerned me was the whole question of the funding that I had got very credible information on as having come from the very uh, place that we sought to uh, dislodge uh, from leadership. And uh, that we had tried to discuss this with our colleagues whom we were convinced were involved and that those discussions did not yield any results. So first there was at the very minimum, suspicion of hostile money having come into our party for the elections and from a source uh, that could only be hostile, which was not adequately resolved to certainly my satisfaction. But that secondly, as if to indeed confirm my worries, that when the election, when the candidate was eventually selected, the candidate as usual selected the campaign management team, a campaign bureau, which is absolutely critical for a presidential election. Because a presidential election is an election, is a campaign that's held in the whole country and within a short time. And it's critical that there is effective campaigning going on across the country even where the candidate is not and where the candidate has been. And it's also such a team that mobilizes resources that are necessary, planning and resources that are necessary for the conduct of the campaign. So a campaign team was appointed, but shortly thereafter disbanded. And so we had a presidential candidate without a campaign management team for the first time. Uh, and uh, that then cannot be a serious uh, campaign once you have no planning and no management of such a process. And as I have said, this on top of having got information that the money actually came from another candidate. <laughs> sort of confirmed to me that uh, it was intended to weaken any or to avoid any serious challenge to where this, the source of the money had come from. And so in that 
regard and considering the risks of the campaign, especially in that particular campaign where there was COVID, I decided to uh, stay away from campaigning also. Now, having addressed the National Council in those terms in November of last year, the matter then now became uh, more uh, discussed within the party and certainly it spilled into the public and now became a public debate. But I would like to also once again point out that between 2020, when this information came up, and 2022, when I presented it to the National Council, there was a lot of attempt at trying to indeed get to the bottom of this matter and um, manage it uh, within the confines of our party. Because even if one may be without consultations uh, made a decision to raise funds from such sources, uh, if it is understood that this has happened, it could be managed differently to immunize the party from the dangers it would face. And we took a lot of time trying to do that. Regrettably, we failed, and that is why it came to the National Council. And of course, once I presented it to the National Council, the Honorable Nathan Nandala Mafabi then uh, offered an immediate response to the National Council, and on the basis of that, the National Council, considering that um, these were just now pieces of information from me and from him, they, in their wisdom, decided to set up what was termed the Special Elders Committee to inquire into this matter. And the Special Elders Committee was not appointed until six months later. And the reason for the delay in appointing the Elders Committee was a controversy that immediately arose as to who should appoint the Elders Committee. Whether it should be appointed by the National Executive, whose members were indeed to be inquired into, or whether it should be appointed by the Chairman of the National Council to whom the committee would then report. As it turned out, eventually, it was decided that the decision of the National Council was uh, to be implemented by the National Executive Committee, and that the National Executive Committee was to appoint this Elders Committee. And indeed, the National uh, Executive Committee, or, or rather the President of the party, made recommendations to the National Executive Committee, the appointment of, of his appointment. And I understand the National Executive Committee approved his appointment of the Elders Committee. Now, that is 
I think where part of the weakness of this committee lies in that it was appointed by the accused and would report to the same accused. <laughs> in fact, it was inaugurated by the accused and in, on the inauguration, uh, given, assigned the task that they were supposed to do. And I did not learn of the task that was given to them by the party president, the Honorable Amri at Oboy at the inauguration until I appeared before this committee. And uh, the task given to the committee was rather strange because their main task was then to reconcile me and the Honorable Nanda Ramafabi. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, by so doing to bring harmony to the party. And I'm sure, I hope you have got copies of the elders, uh, this special elders uh, committee, because it's now a public uh, document. And uh, you will see what I am talking about contained in that report that their mission was to reconcile us. Now, as I presented to the committee, when I eventually met them, I did not have, and I do not have up to now, any personal matters, issues, with the Honorable Nanda Ramafari. In fact, until this money issue arose, uh, I considered him uh, a, not just a colleague, but even a friend. And uh, it was on that basis, indeed, that uh, he entrusted me with 300 million shillings, which I will be also uh, talking about uh, at this <coughs> A meeting. Uh, he entrusted me that 300 million shillings just between the two of us. There is no record of any kind, no acknowledgement, note or anything. Uh, that could not happen if there were issues uh, between us. Uh, and so I told the committee that there are absolutely no issues between me and the Honorable Nandala over which a reconciliation is needed. That the issues at hand are issues of the party and uh, affecting the party and its officials, how the officials of the party are running the party. And, uh, and that I had indeed pointed out to the National Council that set up the committee that two things needed to be focused on. One, the money, and two, the management of the party, and especially of the campaign. And having said that, I went ahead and narrated to the committee what happened from the time the Honorable Nandala Mafabi entrusted me to keep his 300 million shillings up to the time I reported to the National Council. So I gave them the whole narration of what happened. 
And uh, I also pointed out to them that therefore they will help the party primarily by establishing the facts relating to the money. And that the facts would be found in the accounts of the party and the records of the party. Which accounts and records we had been inquiring into ourselves prior to my appearance before the National Council, but had been denied because eventually they said we were not entitled to such uh, information. So I, I thought that this committee now was going to help us get the facts. Because up until then, and I dare say, until now, even as we sit here, nobody in the party knew where the money came from, how much it was, and how it was employed. Up to now, there is no, because at the time uh, this information came, <clears throat> there was an acting party president, the OHT wa Joyce Nabosa Sebuguao, who of course has since left us. And in fact, in her departing uh, quarrels, this was one of her concerns that she was the party leader, money came, and she didn't get any information of any kind about the money that came, where it came from, what, how it was used. In fact, she, uh, she said she had lent 20 million to the party because there was no money to be used, while at the same time there was money that was already in the party. So neither the acting party president then no, the substantive party president, the Honorable Patrick Amri Boy, knew how much money had been secured by the party, from where, on what terms, and how it was being used. And so that's why I emphasized to the committee that this is the best help they can give to the party. Establish the facts. How much money came, whether borrowed, whether donated, whether stolen or whatever, how much money came to the party. How was it deployed? And uh, the committee uh, told me they were going to indeed inquire. They said they had many people to interview. And uh, that is what eventually they reported on in this report. Or eventually, we have now received their report. Maybe before I leave the committee situation, it's also maybe pertinent to point out that 
The committee had been appointed as seven members. One refused to take up the appointment, and I don't know what happened. So actually, only six uh, turned up uh, as members. One of the members is a vice chairman of the party, and uh, therefore uh, a member of the chair that would receive uh, the report. So he was uh, uh, he was uh, clearly uh, inquiring into the matter that he set up. Uh, this was pointed that this anomaly was pointed out, but uh, um, he didn't consider it necessary to recuse uh, himself. And one of the members eventually resigned from the committee with protestation of how the committee was conducting itself. And uh, he especially, in his protestation, written protestation, pointed out that uh, the committee secretariat of the committee, the secretary of the committee, who I understand was appointed by the Honorable Nandala Mafabi, was uh, recording wrongly what was uh, being uh, presented to the committee and that his uh, protests were not addressed. I think he had also other issues that he raised in his uh, protests. Um, it may also be noteworthy that while this committee was going on to inquire into the matter given to it by National Council and later directly appointed by the executive, the same members who appointed it set out to present information to party leaders across the country on matters that the same committee was inquiring into. They held leaders, party leaders meetings from in the districts of uh, Busoga, Bukedi, Bugisu, Teso, Lango, Acholi, West Nile, presenting now even documents to these uh, uh, party leaders uh, to, to uh, argue about uh, this very subject that they had assigned to the committee. Now that obviously was uh, violating this, the, 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 sole, the purpose of, the, of setting up the committee. But even more concerning, in one of the meetings which sat in uh, Iganga, the chair of the committee of the committee of elders also attended where these violations were, uh, were happening. And, uh, you know, I pointed out to him that this was uh, very imprudent, uh, to say the least. So that is a rather long background to the report that we now have a report of the committee, 19-page report, which, as I have said, is now a public uh, document. 
So what does this report say? Maybe before I turn to the report itself, it is fair to give details of one of the things that uh, has uh, been focused on regarding this data money. And that is that 300 million that the Honorable Nandala gave me. First, the Honorable Nandala has been telling a lie to say that he told me it was meant for agents, polling agents in that election. Clearly, if he had said it was party money meant for agents, I would have provided the obvious uh, uh, solution that it should be placed on the party account. Because whereas him as a person would fear, and he told me the reason he was giving me the money was that he feared revenue authority, that revenue authority was demanding money from his companies. And that if he placed cash, that if he had cash on his accounts, revenue authority would pounce on it and that it would be difficult to recover it. And I know that is for sure happening with the Revenue Authority. There is the law they passed called, uh, that gives powers of Ganesh, uh, where the tax body, if, it, if you owe it tax, they can confiscate money that is on your account and uh, pay themselves the tax. And if you have any queries, you go to the tax tribunal. And people have suffered that injustice from revenue authority. Once they go to the tax tribunal and they show that they did not owe revenue authority, revenue authority does not return the money even then. They say, okay, sorry, we now have the, we know that you don't owe us, so we shall keep on deducting this from your future. <laughs> from your future obligations. <laughs> so revenue authority is actually a thief <laughs> because that is really stealing. And this is going on widely. And that's why I had sympathy with the Honorable Nandala when he told me that he had tax issues with the revenue authority and that's why he was keeping cash out of the bank. But if he had clearly told me that this is money for agents, the party has no tax issues. So the money would have gone to the party account. If, uh, and if the party, uh, if the, the only issues the party can have with the revenue authority is maybe payee, if they have not remitted their payee to the, uh, to, to the revenue authority, which... Uh, certainly would be even then a, a totally different uh, different matter. So it's a lie that money was extended to me to keep for agents. party agents. In any case, this was September. The election was going to be in, was it January or February? January. So why would <laughs> <laughs> Why have to keep money for that long for, 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 for agents? So that is the first untruth. Having given me that money, as I have pointed out previously in other communications, it was about two weeks later that I got specific information of the dirty money. And 
but maybe before I get to the to the, to the information, uh, I told the Honorable Nandala that my home was obviously not secure because my home is always being surrounded and sometimes searched. So I say I told him I can't keep it myself. I would keep it somewhere, which I also discussed with him that could be safe. And uh, my first concern came with the arrival of the money. Because the money arrived at my home at 10 p.m. He rang me. We, we, he had told me he would send the money. We met here actually when he told me. It was about 8 in the morning. But the man arrived at about 10 p.m. And he rang me saying that the other thing I talked about is about to arrive. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I said, but Nathan, where is it passing? Because this is curfew time. There was a curfew then. And people are not allowed to move. And those who were allowed to move certainly would even risk to carry such money <laughs> in the curfew time. But he said, don't worry, don't worry, it's about to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, before uh, long, there was somebody was hooting at my gate. I opened, and it was his driver alone. He was one man in the car. And uh, he told me, the, here is uh, what was given to me to deliver to you. It was a big box. Now, because of the worry I got of uh, that man arriving in curfew time, I thought very quickly, because I, I thought this may cause me problems. Because if it comes and other, some people know that money has come here and I have no way of getting it out. <laughs> so I can be found with this money and maybe it has issues. So I thought quickly and uh, got one of my uh, helpful neighbors to accept to keep something for me. He wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I detained I detained the driver, having given me the box. Well, when I received the box, I opened it. It contained brand new 20,000 shilling notes, packed, uh, of course, in 20 millions, wrapped with polythene paper, with a, a Bank of Uganda uh, uh, label on, on each on each bundle showing the number of uh, the, the, the note, the numbers on each note in the bundle, the serial numbers. <coughs> and, uh, 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 and, and that too got me a bit uh, unsettled, but I anyway transferred this money to out of my home before I released the driver to go away. And it was then two weeks later that the information about that money got to me. The first information, I got two pieces of information. The first piece of information got to me. And uh, shortly thereafter, I think within the week, I got the second piece of information. And in the second piece of information, I got slightly more details about some people who's, to whom some of that money was, was given. One of whom was the party president, the Honorable Amri Atoboy, whom it was said had received 280 million. And so I thought it was 
helpful to begin with that one and see whether it was indeed true or not that uh, he received money. And so I called the Honorable Amuriat and we met and I asked him, did you receive money from the Honorable Nandara? And he said, yes. I said, how much? He said, 280 million. Did he tell you where it came from? No. Said, no. But in the neck, we had passed a resolution that we should borrow money. So I assume that uh, this is part of what was borrowed. <laughs> and I said, okay, did, if it was borrowed, would you know how much? He said, no, I, I'm not even sure that it was borrowed, so I don't know how much. I got the, just got this money. I said, so what are you doing with it? And he said, well, at that time, he was moving around the country with the Honorable Waswa Birigwa in the primary campaigns for the flag of the party. So he said, I am using part of it in that uh, process, in the movement around the country, and that they had also agreed that while they are moving around, he should identify candidates and uh, maybe help some of them who needed some help. And he said he was keeping accountability. So having uh, told me as much, I now shared with him my own information. And indeed that I also had 300 million uh, in my custody. And I said, so what do we do with this information? And in the event, we decided to engage those who were involved in the meetings, because they are, the information we had got, there were meetings before this money was got. There was a budget made that was taken to State House, and then the money came. So those who were involved with that information who were the Honorable Nandala himself, <coughs> the Honorable Jack Sabiti, the Honorable Jeffrey Ekanya. Uh, we said we meet with them, and I invited them myself, and we met here in our garden. Just to be sure there was somebody that was not part of that as some kind of uh, a reference point, I also invited the Honorable Wafula Ogu to here. And I introduced to them my information. I was promptly challenged by the Honorable Jack Sabiti, who said, how can I ask the party leaders where they are getting money, when they themselves never asked me where I got money when I was party leader? Isn't it a double standards? Why are you now asking these ones? And I think that question, for me, summarizes and it has actually been kept on being played. In any case, if they get money and it helps the party, what is the problem? Clearly, there is gross underrating of the gravity of this matter. You know, 
receiving uh, money from because you know our struggle has been very costly to those who want change you know many people have died many people are maimed hmm? It's emotional. For people to think that, you know, the change you are fighting for, and, you know, at some stage, the, the Honorable Jack Sabiti said that, for me, I, I am moved by hatred that I hate Museveni. that I hate Museveni uh, and that is why, you know, I uh, react in the way I do. Far from it. This has nothing to do with individuals. It has everything to do with how we procure change in this country. First of all, if, if there is a need for change and how we procure change. Because you've heard us say over and over again that our country has been captured by the family of Mr. Museven. Not even by an institution, not by NRM, not by uh, even the military, it's by the family. And we know what has happened to institutions where the money has gone from that institute, from those sources. So to trivialize it and say, you know, uh, because the, the supposition was that maybe me also, I was getting money from there. Why am I asking others where they are getting money? But if anybody would have information <clears throat> that the very problem you want to remove is the one facilitating you and you keep quiet about it then you are you are sort of abating treason you are helping the destruction of the mission so anyway uh, that meeting which we held here did not yield the results. After that, the Honorable Nandala pulled out some files uh, that he wanted to explain where the money came from, that it was, is the, it is his money, but we didn't uh, get into those details. Save for that having uh, been the first sign for me that poor uh, Patrick Amriat was also involved because the reason I approached him first was that my information was that he was not uh, part of it. Yes. But when I invited all these for a meeting here, he was the only one who knew why. I was inviting the meeting. So I, when I saw Nandala pull out files to give explanation, when I had not told him why I was inviting him, I immediately knew that he was informed <laughs> in advance what the meeting was all about. <clears throat> we tried still uh, shortly after that meeting failed to generate any progress but it was clear that we would not make much progress mainly because of the uh, election 
activities that were taking place at the same time. So we decided to uh, to sort of freeze the attempt to establish and manage this uh, until the election ends. And as I have pointed out, that was part of the reason I, I did not want to be involved in, the, in that campaign. Of course, uh, we carried out the same attempt after the election, which uh, we have uh, talked about already. Now, when that information came to me about that money, I quickly went back to the money which had been given to me and removed those labels from Bank of Uganda which were showing the notes, the serial numbers of the monies involved. And that is because new money coming out of the central bank can be traceable when it is released to circulation. That's how they ensure that there are no counterfeits. The serial numbers are traceable. And especially if it is new money, like we had now, it's possible to know where it was released to. So I recovered uh, that information, which eventually I also supplied to the committee of elders, but which I also used myself to find out more information about, about this money. So, after failing to make progress with it, nobody uh, talked about what we should do with this money. In fact, I was co consulting with my colleagues what should what can we? What should we do with this money? We now uh, think is problematic. We had taken a decision; it should definitely be returned. Uh, but as I have said, there was the whole hula bar of the election going on then, and then I am in Rukunjiri. Uh, towards the election itself, and I get a telephone call from the Honorable Nandala that they want the money to use it for agents. And that was the first time I heard of this story of agents. Said the other money, we want to use it now for agents. I said, fine, it can be, you can have it. Uh, now, since I was away, I suggested to him that it can be put at my petrol station in Zambia, where there, is, there was some security, and that it can be picked from there. And uh, I informed the person where it was being kept to then deliver it to Zambia. And uh, I was completely under the impression that that had been. Uh, and the, the other point I wanted it delivered it uh, delivered from Zambia was that I wanted an acknowledgement uh, of the delivery itself that the money was returned. And when I asked uh, the manager I had in Zambia. She said, yes, the money was, uh, was given to the uh, administra administrative office, I think, of the, of the party, and uh, she had signed. 
It's only now during this inquiry that I have had, so neither uh, the people in FDC nor anybody in, in Zambia told me that uh, there was any problem with the delivery of the money. <laughs> I only now learned about it during this inquiry when indeed the Honorable Nanda Lamafabi was distributing papers to uh, show or suggest that I received 300 million but returned 299 million and something. That there was 600,000, I think, which was not, not returned. I had not heard about that at all, either from the party or from my manager. And so when, and, and, and the other thing he was indicating was that it was uh, delivered, it was returned on different, on different, uh, in different in, in installments. So when that came out, I obviously uh, had to in investigate uh, what uh, had happened uh, and uh, I indeed established that it was true the money was received I think in three or three or four installments but that that was the wish of the, of the lady who was receiving it it was not because uh, it, there was no money to receive, but that she didn't want to take it at a go. That was uh, her request. Secondly, I got to learn that part of that money, because it had stayed where we put it for long, and that during the election time, money becomes devalued, loses value, that they decided to translate part of it into dollars. And so, when I said, please return the money, they also returned the money still in dollars. But the dollars, apparently, instead of gaining value, which was expected in the elections, actually the value had gone down. The exchange rate had gone down, leading to that difference in the money that was not returned. As I have said, clearly nobody informed me about this. Uh, there was absolutely no reason I would want to keep 600,000 uh, of money belonging to, to the party with me. If I wanted, I could have kept the 300 million because there was no, I did not uh, sign for it anywhere. I did, nobody knew, even I had it. It's me who told uh, all the people that were involved that this money had been brought to me. And, uh, and so I acknowledge that the 600,000 or so that is being talked about was not returned. Certainly I was not informed. And, uh, uh, you know, if they want them, if, if, if I have where to put the money, I have no problem returning it. I have actually written out a check. Uh, I'm only worried about whom, whom to give it. <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, uh, I wouldn't want it to... To, to go into the hands that are dirty also. Uh, uh, but that is the disposition of the 300 million that was brought to me. My suspicion is that this 300 million was go supposed to be part of the distribution because indeed there were others who received and I think uh, 
uh, even if I had used it, there would have been. Uh, th that's what I think was intended that I, I use it. But that's my own suspicion with hindsight now. Now, so let's go to the report. As you will see in the report, the committee of elders did not make the slightest attempt to establish the facts. Zero. In spite of my having uh, pleaded with them to do so, they did not check on the party accounts or party records, they did not improve the knowledge that we had before they were formed. In fact, their own, their only written finding, their only written finding is that this was a very sensitive matter. <laughs> that's, that's, that's their only written finding, which they themselves try. That's, that's the only thing they found. Beyond that, they only record what each of us told them. That's the only, so there are minutes of the meetings that they held with different people. That's all that this report is. They did not attempt at all to find the facts. So even in this report, you can't, and, and somewhere they say that, uh, in, in Honorable Nandara himself says that he's the one who lent money to the party. They didn't even ask him how much, sir, <laughs> did you lend? So <laughs> even that was too sensitive <laughs> to be asked. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that he told them he withdrew the money he gave me from one of his accounts. Uh, even that they did not uh, that he gave, he supplied some uh, some papers from some company, maybe which he owns or has interest in, to show that he had uh, uh, money in the bank. Uh, no attempt at all to establish the presence or the source of money or how much. Under what terms, if somebody says I lent to the party, okay, you lent to the party, is there an agreement between the lender and the borrower? I mean, at least the committee would have established whether if there, is, there was money lent, what were the terms? From who? Uh, and where was it, where was it placed? Was it placed on the lender, on the borrower's account? Where, what happened to this? Where did the, the borrower <laughs> put the money and how was it accessed? Nothing uh, is, uh, is contained in this report. Indeed, having found nothing, uh, certainly not looked for anything and found nothing, Their recommendations are not surprising. Recommendation number one, reconciliation. <laughs> recommendation number two, tolerance. <laughs> recommendation number three, grooming young leaders. <laughs> recommendation number four, amendment of the constitution. <laughs> recommendation number five, absence of an organogram. 
<laughs> of the party. Recommendation number six, development of party alliances. Number eight, and the last one, management of opposition African political parties. So, neither in their findings, <laughs> nor in their recommendations, did they seek to deal with the dirty money. Save, as, as I have said, just recording what each one of us told them. And even then recording it in a biased way. Because what I, as I have told you, what I uh, emphasized to them is not in the record of what I told them. And I have only been able to see this from their, uh, from their report. So, I don't think that the value of this report is even equal to the paper on which it is <laughs> written, frankly. It is totally worthless. S certainly, what it doesn't do, therefore, is to absolve those suspected of having got that money. I have been seeing in the media, the report absolved. Where in this report does it absorb? <laughs> it doesn't. Because it even never sought to do so. And I think the Honorable Nandara and his colleagues really did not do themselves justice by not using this committee, the opportunity of this committee, providing the facts that would indeed absorb them. Because they could have done so. They could have brought, like he said, he had, borrowed, he had lent money to the party. He could have just brought the, the documentation of the money he lent to the party. As we talk, at least from what I know of these, some of these people who sit in neck, nobody in the party up to now, nearly three years later, nobody knows how much money was borrowed or donated. Or, even if you want to keep the source, they say that the sources are, are sensitive. Okay, sources are sensitive. But how much money did come to our coffers? At least that should not be sensitive. How much money did we receive in our coffers? And how was it dispersed? And as I have said, I think the whole, the whole attitude is because the gravity of this matter is grossly underestimated, you know, by the people concerned, but I think even by quite many in our uh, in our society uh, who say I saw somebody writing uh, uh, somewhere on uh, social media uh, saying but uh, you know we have been telling people that uh, if uh, money from NRM comes you eat it and clean your lips uh, and, and ask for more <laughs> That is very true. You know, th these bribes the movement brings out to our, our population. It is their money. They, they, they can eat it. But money coming from Mr. Museven himself to an organization that is seeking the end of his junta is not something comparable. I have, I've heard people comparing it with uh, maybe getting contributions from people who have an association with the movement. That's not comparable. Even if they were cabinet members, there are many people in the cabinet who want change, actually, and who will quietly contribute to the struggle. 
just like our members go at night to state house. <laughs> Many from state house also come at night to talk to us. <laughs> because they are also there, but they want change. So yes, you can get contributions from such, but not from the very captor of the country, and you hope that that is, that is all right. And uh, there is no free lunch in this world. Any money that is paid has what it is supposed to, uh, to, to get in return. And what would be the motivation of Mr. Museveni paying money to his opponents? Well, you've seen him himself bragging that by 2021 there will be no, no opposition. That's what he was hoping to achieve by 2021. By what means was he intending to achieve that? <laughs> because people keep on talking. You know, you heard what was going on in DP. Oh, you are green outside. You are in Suju. You are yellow inside. You are green. <laughs> and, and, and that, where the money goes, you see a, a change in approach. And specifically, it seeks to achieve two things. First, to fight against those who seek change not through the means that Mr. Museven would want them to do so, which is the rigged election. If you are campaigning for elections, he'll give you the money even. Because you know the election is within his control. But if you are agitating outside elections, you are the enemy. And we've had time to talk about the type of elections he's continue, he continues to, uh, uh, to organize. So that is one of the reasons the money is given. It's to undermine those who seek to use potent means to get rid of him, of the system that captures Uganda. Secondly, it is to stop cooperation of all those who seek change, the working together of all those who seek change unity to fight and get out of oppression. This is uh, the purpose of the of the money that is received. Now, what is the impact of this dirty money to the party. First of all, it has already made the party more or less dysfunctional. <coughs> because a party functions through its organs. The National Executive Committee is now totally dysfunctional because members within that committee whom you saw addressing the press last week uh, have views that the leader of the party does not uh, does not want, and so NEC will not sit. 
Some members even have tried to call it on their own, and he has said the Constitution gives me the power to call. You cannot call, and it becomes neck. And I guess he's right. So there is no sitting now of neck, which is supposed to run the party. So the party is now run on decrees. <laughs> In other words, there is a coup. <laughs> In the party, the party is being run on uh, on a decrease, uh, and this is especially troubling because all this has happened at a time when the party is supposed to change its leadership or to renew its leadership. This renewal should have happened in. 2020, but it was said that because of COVID, elections then were not feasible, so the term of those in office was extended by three years, which end now. So there is an election, it's an election year, and we are now going through electoral processes with a dysfunctional neck which would be overseeing and guiding and managing processes. And indeed you have heard that NEC has decided some things and I think that's when it ceased to, to sit. It decided some things which were totally ignored and uh, uh, those uh, who are managing the party at the helm continued in, in total disregard of NEC decisions. And um, the Electoral Commission, which is supposed to organize these elections, has huge problems now. I think the most public one was that it announced that it has already conducted grassroots elections in 93% of districts. <laughs> And the districts are there. They are not invisible. They are there. <laughs> you can... And, and even where the elections were said to have taken place, I think you members of the media were very helpful in exposing the lies. I saw NTV at uh, somewhere in uh, Luzira, I think, in Rosira, in Nakawa Division, inquiring about where the elections had taken place. <laughs> and they said they had taken place at some church, and they asked uh, the, 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 the gate man there, he said, no, no, there has not been any person here. The world. <laughs> they have been making calls, appointing people into the structures of NRM, some of which calls were recorded and have been shared and so on. So there is a very problematic... Hmm? No, the structures of FDC. Mm -hmm. the, this, the, I said NRM? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's because it's always a problem. <laughs> 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 and now, now, now it's very difficult to differentiate <laughs> what these ones are doing. <laughs> because this, this is what NRM is known for. Surely not FDC. <laughs> that FDC is conducting elections of this kind is a total, total disgrace. Uh, uh, certainly to the founding principles of this of this uh, wonderful party. 
So, the controversies that we are talking about of dirty money and how it is resolved and of how the party is managed are now have now creeped into the process of renewal of leaders. And uh, clearly, the Electoral Commission, by at least by its own pronouncements, is totally discredited. Uh, there are other factors that would discredit it, but at least that is the most obvious and public uh, source of, uh, you know, delegitimizing it. And, uh, and so, you know, the managers at Najanankumbi has have uh, just held on to their guns. Uh, part of it is what you saw play out in the last national council. In the entire history of FDC, I have never seen anything anywhere near the chaos that I saw at Najanankumbi where the National Council was supposed to take place. Uh, and the people have been in Rosira and uh, so on, many were injured and so on and so forth. Uh, and all the other scenes that you have seen, you know, which included beating up <coughs> members of the media at our headquarters. All these are very, very troubling, but, you know, very real. So, where do we go from here? I think is uh, the last bit that I would like to, to address. Uh, the way forward is obviously a very challenging one because one gets a clear sense that the leaders in control of the party today at the helm, the party president, the secretary general, the treasurer general, and uh, these concerned leaders have clearly dug in. They are not at all willing to reflect on the huge responsibility they have to be in charge of that party. Uh, they are determined to move on, selecting leaders until they renew their own positions in the party at a delegates conference. So, in short, as I have said, there is some kind of a coup in the party. The party is captured. I still think that the resilience of, N of, uh, of uh, FDC can be relied on uh, to free the party to function in normal ways. 
because we are still members of this party. And uh, we must, even as we organize the liberation of the country, I think the members of the party have a duty to attempt, at least, to liberate their own party. One Uganda, one people. One people, one Uganda. Uh, the reason they are allocating seats and so on is to create a new reality. Uh, but I think there is still room to challenge that new, the attempt to create a new reality. Because if they had hold the delegates conference, the National Council, I believe, will have to see it again. <clears throat> the term of the leaders will expire at the National Delegates Conference. That's my sense of the law, unless I'm advised differently. So the National Council is still alive, it must prepare for the delegates conference, and the National Council therefore has a chance of freeing what has happened. That will take a resistance struggle to be undertaken. Our members need to, therefore, within the districts, mobilize, organize, and resist what is going on. And uh, I know that um, there are many party leaders who are already working on a plan to now move around the country to touch base with the party owners and to mobilize to make sure that the party is returned in the hands of the owners. So I trust that a program of that uh, objective is going to be availed to the members uh, so that they start mobilizing themselves even before those meetings are held because they, they also held meetings across the country. They held meetings across the country. The others are also entitled to hold meetings across the country. Yes. And we see who the party owners are. <laughs> Secondly, If that National Council then sits, I think it has now no option but to create a transitional leadership that will reorganize all the processes to a new leadership. Because clearly, uh, First of all, the leaders now are expiring. They are supposed to expire. But secondly, they are now encumbered with all these issues. So I think it will be important 
if or when the National Council sits to, if they want to, re, if they are charged to uh, rescue the party from a path of destruction, they should create a transitional leadership to carry us through this contentious time. Secondly, I hope that transitional leadership will appoint competent firms or people to undertake a forensic audit of the party. Forensic audit of party resources. I think it is important, it is critical, and it in the benefit of all, so that we know the truth. Something which could, could have, we could have been saved by the elders committee if it had directed its mind properly. Uh, so I think because a forensic audit can establish sources of money, even when you say I'm the one who lent uh, the party, the forensic auditors can establish whether you lent them your money or some bodices. The auditors are able to establish this. Money is traceable, where it comes from, where it goes. That's why uh, these days, because of terrorism, the major source of tracing terror money, terrorism is money, following the money. So money can be followed by forensic auditors and established, and we resolve some of these controversies and get over them. Thirdly, and most importantly for me, is that all these wrangles within parties have the effect, and may be intended effect, of diverting us from our main focus of liberating the country. That's our main focus. So we are held down trying to sort out in-house issues and not paying attention to the capture of the country. We must be reminded that, first of all, these parties are being captured because the country itself is, is captured. So if we were able to free the country, the parties would also become immediately free. So our focus must not be removed from the liberation of the country. And as you all know, that is the central focus of what we do here at Katonga Road. At Katonga Road, we are not charged with the preparing candidates for elections, we are charged with uh, uniting all oppressed people to see that we resist those who captured our country and free it from them. That's what we do here. And therefore, going forwards, I think the people's government, which also has an elaborate structure of activists across the country. And the people's government has two structures, actually. One which is seen and known, and another one which is covert, which is not seen. We have two structures across the country. It is time, even as these wrangles are being sorted out and as the liberation of the party processes are going on. It is a time that we also focus on the liberation of the country so that the two are not, one is not to the exclusion of the other one. And um, 
to that extent, the leadership of the people's government and its partners, we also have partners in the PFT in, and in other places, but the people's government to which we are primarily uh, concerned is going is already in the process of invigorating its leadership also so that we move we intensify the resistance against the uh, the capture of our country and uh, so the moving around of the country, it means will be with due objectives. First one, the liberation of the party. But secondly, the liberation of the uh, of the of the country. By the way, before I maybe completely leave this whole question of liberating the party, there has been a suggestion that the reason the leaders in Najanankumbi are hell-bent on continuing with the fraudulent elections is because of the time limit they have within which to have a new leadership. In other words, a constitutional constraint. There is no constitutional constraint that our organs cannot deal with. What is motivating them is rather what they have also said, that we want to buy time for those who are aspiring to become leaders to get to know the party because they are new. <laughs> and in this, I'm sure they are having a swipe at uh, Omulodi, who is the, the newest of our senior leaders. Uh, but even, uh, I think, Semuju, they say these people are new, are rather new. <laughs> they now want more time uh, to, 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 to reach out to members they don't know so that they become electable. And they think that that's a good enough reason to have fraudulent elections. Uh, I would rather think that if it is not selfish, even if there was time allowed for people to know the electorate so that they choose the best leaders, there would be nothing <laughs> wrong with it. Certainly this is not the motivation. The motivation is simply that there hasn't been preparation. Uh, but uh, to advance an excuse that you don't want, in other words, you want to take advantage of, of your own knowledge of the party while others don't have knowledge of the party is, uh, is only in the interest of those individuals, not of the party. Because the party would want to have the best leaders possible to lead us to the success we want. You have seen parties even import leaders at the time of elections. You saw in Tanzania when the, the main opposition party got as their flag bearer somebody who did not belong to the party, but who, are, who was able to achieve a lot for the party. So we are, I think, trapped in selfish pursuits here. And some people, of course, accuse me of 
having, you know, also selfish interests in FDC. I cannot and no longer seek to be a leader in FDC. I served my two terms, as said by the Constitution, I cannot be a leader again. And I'm not seeking leadership in FDC. I am not even seeking leadership uh, in the government. I am only seeking freedom for our country so that we can have an equal voice in this country. <laughs>